Hi, this is Darcy Sullivan from the Oscar Wilde Society. And today we're having a chat with Don Mead, the chairman of the Oscar Wilde Society, who's been a member for around 30 years and been the chairman officially for about 20 years. And we're going to talk to Don about the Oscar Wilde Society, about his time editing the Wild Inn, and also about his feelings and opinions, of course, about Oscar Wilde. So Don, thank you for having us here today in your beautiful home. Don, when did you first encounter Oscar Wilde? In the school playground. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, just refresh my memory. Um, I was, uh, oh, about six or seven, I suppose. And in the school playground, rude rhymes and chants were exchanged. A fat child, because they were fat in those days, not obese, a fat child was called Fatty Arbuckle, uh, the film star of the, mm -hmm. that, that period. And uh, Oscar Wilde came into it. The boy stood on the burning deck. His back was to the mast. He did not move a single step as Oscar Wilde walked past. But Oscar was a wily bird. He threw the boy a plum. And as he stooped to pick it up, <laughs> and that was the sort of rhyme. There was another one, the, the, ball, the ball went up his trouser leg and hit his metal wicket, all this sort of thing which <laughs> school children in playgrounds find funny mm -hmm. and for all I know and hope still do. <laughs> but what it does mean is that in the back of my mind as I was growing up, all that I knew really about Oscar was this uh, sexual oddity about him. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a pansy or whatever, whatever the terminology at the time was. Um, you see, I wasn't one of those who can say, as so many do, ah, I was brought up on Oscar Wilde's fairy tales as a child. Mm. Maybe I was, maybe I heard them, but I can't honestly say I've got any recollection. Um, my... As I grew into my teens, my first sort of serious author that I uh, really enjoyed and uh, in a small way collected, you know, I bought his, bought his books from second-hand bookshops was uh, Thackeray. My encounter with Oscar as a writer was with a perfectly dreadful book called In the King's Treasuries of Literature. This was a pre-war student edition of a large selection, about 15, I suppose, of um, miscellaneous plays. And this included uh, The Importance of Being Earnest, just a section of it. It was edited by a chap called um, 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 C.E. Eckersley, M.A. And he said... Uh, one gets weary of the endless fireworks of epigrams, he said. Mm. This is in the introduction of our people in the upper remover at impressionable age and reading. And although the plot is purely farcical, you may feel you like to know how it ends. So rather patronisingly, he summarised in the last few pages, uh, for the last few lines, uh, what uh, what the importance of Ernest was, being, was about. Um, so I worked on this, and I've still got the thing. I nearly threw it away in disgust several times, but I still kept it. And what interests me about it is that in the, pen, in the margins, uh, carefully written in pencil, in my schoolboy hand, are aphorism, epigram, paradox. Do you know, in those days, I knew the difference. I'm not <laughs> sure I do now. Anyway, despite this Mr Eckersley, uh, I found the play funny, just this excerpt. And then I remember we did a dramatised reading, also in the upper remove, of the whole play, just in, the, you know, in school. And then I really realised, you know, seriously realised this is a funny play. So I got into Oscar by really three different routes. One of them is the literature side, which began with the importance of being earnest. Then when I was a law student, entirely separately from all this, I was doing um, uh, my law studies and going to the Wildy second-hand bookshop in, um, near the Inter Court. And I just came across the Montgomery Hyde Trials of Oscar Wilde. And that really did hit me between the eyes, as it were, because I didn't know anything in detail at all.
and the trials of Oscar Wilde most certainly fills in any gaps in one's knowledge. So that was an important part of my getting to understand what Oscar was about. And then the uh, that led me to biographies. I read um, Hesketh Pearson, which I still think is an indispensable early biography because it's written by somebody who knew people who knew Oscar and people who knew Bosey. So it's got a, an immediacy about it, which uh, makes some of the other biographies seem a bit second-hand. So Hesketh Pearson, Pearson was very good. And um, I, the next one, I suppose, was uh, Montgomery Hyde's biography. That was, uh, what, 76? So I was beginning to get into Oscar in the biographic sense as well. But the writings... I mean, I just had uh, one of the Collins complete works and then I was buying miscellaneous things as they came up because in those days you didn't look for things on a books. A books didn't exist in those days. You went to bookshops and saw what they had. You went in, anything by or about Oscar Wilde, please, you know, and sometimes you would find, well, you did find quite a lot of interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got, for example my copy of um, uh, Ada Leveson's Recollections of Oscar Wilde, signed copy, that just turned, wow. up in a, turned up in a bookshop. Very battered copy, but then Ada Leveson was unkind to books, put glasses on them and scattered powder on them. So I picked up all sorts of things like that. I was beginning to build up an Oscar Wilde collection. And uh, the... Going along with that was the process of uh, understanding Oscar and learning more about him. And I think there were one or two key things there, accidental things, as to say. Um, one was uh, finding a copy of the letters, which uh, uh, I hadn't bought new, but I, I, as I say, I picked up in a, one of my many visits to second-hand bookshops, and that really opened my eyes because of the, well, the enormous variety of his witty correspondence and, um, of course, reading De Profundis in full because I remember being totally puzzled by the Robbie Ross edited edition. Mm. It didn't seem... There seemed to be something strange about it which I didn't really warm to at all. It seemed all a bit fanciful and uh, rather forced, but reading it the proper the whole text, another matter altogether. Mm. And I, these are random recollections. I also remember picking up, just by luck, a copy of the reviews, the, uh, in the collected, you know, the Matthew and collected edition. And I remember, I can still remember getting it at Waterloo and reading it on the train and thinking, these are wonderful Oscar Wilde reviews, absolutely splendid mm. stuff. So when you were going into bookstores and asking if they had any books by or about Oscar Wilde, did you ever get any funny looks or any, any confrontations? Uh, no, never got that. Um, I did once get a voice from the other side of a bookcase saying, did you say Oscar Wilde? It was a lady's voice. It was Lady Alice Douglas. Huh. She was there because she said in her family nobody had kept any of the books about Oscar Wilde. Mm. So she was looking for the basics. She hadn't even got her father's book, so or, or uncle's book, whoever it was. Do you have a favourite work by Oscar? Oh, that's very hard, you know. <laughs> I, uh, you know, one can say importance of being honest, in a sense it, it is. Um, I think from the point of view of things that I've... Uh, benefited from rereading um, the intentions, decay of lying, uh, critic as artist. But really, it's got to be the ballad. Ballad of Reading Jail mm. uh, was you know, an astonishing thing to read straight through mm. the first time. Really was, as opposed to silly bits of excerpts mm. in anthologies. Yeah. Just to read the whole thing. And um, I remember being haunted by uh, um, who can tell to what red hell 
his sightless soul may stray. Mm. I remember that phrase really, you know, mm. haunting me. And um, the last, last three verses, mm. you know, the well, the well, the very well known ones. Mm. Um, no, the whole thing. That's. I think it must be my favourite. If you put me in a corner, make me choose. Okay. That's the one. Yeah. Dan, how did you become acquainted with the Oscar Wilde Society? I bought a copy of, I think I'm right in saying, uh, Philippe Julien's biography from a bookseller in the City of London. And when I went to the cash desk, uh, the young lady there said, oh, if you're interested in Oscar Wilde, you might be interested in this, and handed me the Oscar Wilde Society leaflet. Mm. This is going back to the right at the very beginning the Joanna Crook days, and uh, she, she and uh, Terry Bushnell and the uh, Sue Baker, the original members of the Oscar Wilde Society at that time, had, among other things, got together a, a you know, simple, straightforward leaflet. Um, Oscar Wilde Society, here's a contact number. And I remember phoning up Terry Bushnell, and we had a long chat, and I thought, well, sounds good. So uh, that was how I... Got to join. And it was a fairly new society when you joined. It was new at that time, yeah. Like oh, yes. a year old or something? About, about a year, year and a half or something like mm -hmm. that, yeah. yeah. I didn't actually get into being involved in the society at the very beginning um, because I'm still working. And uh, the last uh, year or so of my job was, was pretty intense, so I didn't really do much uh, uh, in the way of... Uh, pursuing my interest in Oscar at all. Uh, but, um, in fact, I missed one or two of the very early events, to my, to my sorrow. But um, that, was how I, that was how I got, got involved. Mm. Yeah. When and how did you become the chairman of the society? Well, I, first of all, became a committee member. Mm -hmm. uh, that happened at a, a certain AGM at the Chelsea Arts Club, uh, where um, Andy McDonnell and Bindon Russell two of the first leading lights of the society were both there. And um, I was, uh, I, I think I heard myself say, if, if by any chance you should have a vacancy on the committee, I would be, and that I was appointed, you know, mm. absolutely instantly. So I became a member of the committee at that, at that particular AGM. Mm -hmm. and, and what were, did you have a role in the committee? Uh, no, no, we didn't yeah. have we didn't have roles. Mm. We were just committee members. Mm. And um, what really happened was that uh, the editor of the Wildian, a uh, chap called James Clutton, who'd done it from the very beginning, uh, had done four issues, and he was really giving up. They wanted somebody else. I was able to say that I had been the editor of the Cornhill magazine. Which sound, which sound totally is totally absurd. It is that when I was working for Cornhill Insurance Company, we had a house journal, house magazine, mm -hmm. uh, just for the entertainment of the staff. It wasn't compulsory reading, and we asked Macmillan's, I think it was, uh, whether the name Cornhill Magazine, which was after a famous name, uh, was still uh, in use, copyright or anything. I said no. Nothing. You can use mm. it if you want to. So we did. <laughs> so my qualification for starting with the uh, the Wildian, taking over from James Club, was that I had been editor of a house magazine of my of my employers, which was a in its, its small way quite quite good as uh, house journals go, mm -hmm. because I had the support of a uh, chap called. Uh, John Heald, who was later became chairman of the Bedroom Society, he was mm. a colleague of mine. So there were the two of us. Uh, we we did this thing more or less more or less for fun. So I took on the Wildian. And did you enjoy editing the Wildian? Oh yes, very much. I um, started with issue number five, and uh, I had just about enough material to to fill it. And it was absolutely from scratch because uh, there was nothing to start with at all except a, a Romeo thing. I don't know how it was put together, really. Um, I remember I 
used Penguin New Writing because it happened to be handy and it happened to be A5 size and it had a contents page which was suitable for uh, the, the, the first issue of the Wildium. Um, I had a computer which would, uh, it would do not only um, uh, Calibri or whatever the, the basic typeface was, did Times New Roman in two sizes. <laughs> it would do 6 point, 10 point and 12, no, three sizes, 6 point, 10 point and 12 point. So this was the technology available, a computer that would just about do that stuff. And uh, mercifully, I started right because I said I will work in A5. It's an A5 publication, so I will work in A5 and see how it goes. Because I was just playing this entirely by ear. It was two parts, really. It was the editing of the magazine in the sense of uh, checking the material, choosing the material, um, writing a bit of it, and also the setting of it. The two have been inextricably put mixed together in my experience from the very beginning. So I uh, set this thing in A5, had it printed by a local printer down the road here, and um, I subsequently uh, gradually established a house style. Every time I made a decision as to what size a typeface should be or whether it was going to be small capitals or italics or whatever, I kept a little note. So I had a running collection of notes, which was, in fact, the Wildian style guide. <laughs> and uh, it, the pr process of producing the magazine was twofold. It was the content and it was the physical bringing it into being, mm -hmm. the setting of it. So I've always felt that it's, it's a proper paper journal. Mm. It's never existed in my mind in anything except its current A5 form. Mm. Could be larger, but that's how it happened to be. In your time, the Wildian went from a society journal or a society magazine to really being the leading publication, the leading academic publication about Oscar Wilde. It did over a long period. I mean, the progress was, was a gradual but progressive. Um, the because the, there were landmarks in in this uh for example it happened that uh i think i'm right in saying issue six was a special issue as it were for the centenary and uh there were worldwide celebrations of oscar at that time you couldn't open a newspaper without there being something about oscar wilde every day there was something uh there were theatrical performances publications lectures talks exhibitions all sorts of things all over the world and these were uh news items and so i gathered together thumping great file of newspaper cuttings about the uh, Oscar Wilde centenary and uh, largely myself wrote it up, one or two other people contributed a bit. Uh, so that was one landmark in the uh, development of it. Uh, the other thing was the progressive uh, business of getting contributors. Um, I, there I had a lot of help from very nice authors who did it out of the goodness of their heart, contributed. Um, Anne Clark and Moore is one. Uh, Joy Melville is another. Um, Jonathan Fryer, most particularly Jonathan, who after all is a professional journalist, but he wrote articles about uh, uh, events, the um, unveiling of the Maggie Hamling statue, for example and the uh, premiere of the uh, Stephen Fry film. Uh, I mean, he wrote authoritative and entertaining articles. So I had people like that. And so I was progressively able to say, when I was soliciting a contribution, because I was doing a lot of that, writing to people and saying, you know, I've noticed you had an interesting something or other book. Would you care to write an article for me, for The Wildian? And I was then able to say, The Wildian is a journal and among its contributors are, and the among its contributors are list began to grow and become more authoritative. So it gradually built up until there was almost a crossing point from me trying to get people to write articles to it became more the other way around, people submitting articles. So there was a sort of crossover point 
in which one became uh, established in the literary market. In your time, did you have any controversial articles? Um, we did have a bit of controversy over articles uh, related to Oscar's boys, how old they were. There were one or two queries about that. Um, if you mean controversy in the sense of editorial problems, um, there are one or two things I uh, look back on and think, <laughs> was it really necessary to print that one? But that's going back to the very early days. Mm. Um, I have had one or two little exchanges. I think one, one that comes to mind is there's a, a lady of uh, not unknown, um, I'm not mentioning her by name, I assure you, uh, but she was one of more than two people who fastened on the American Psychological Association's classification of personality disorders or something of that kind. Mm -hmm. uh, like you have a narcissistic, narcissistic, is that narcissistic, narcissistic personality disorder. Or if you are Bosie, you have. And if you are Oscar, possibly you have. And she wrote one of those articles saying, oh, we, the characteristics of this, uh, of Bosie or of Oscar match the American description of narcissistic personality disorder, exclamation mark, as if it were a great discovery. So I mustn't be too dismissive. Anyway, um, one of those. And this lady uh, objected to the way I had set the article. She said, but Oscar didn't write, this is quoting a letter, if you please, Oscar letter. Uh, he didn't write what you've done. He wrote and she transcribed it. And what she did was actually transcribe from the written letter where Oscar had large handwriting on little Victorian letter paper and got about three words on each line. That was as many as the paper mm -hmm. would take with his big scroll. And she said that was how he intended it to be read. And she quoted Emily Dickinson as an example of somebody who wrote poems with, with short lines. And this was totally bonkers. <laughs> but I could not convince her. Uh, there was one where um, it was a, a letter which uh, Merlin had commented on at some stage on how it was uh, phrased and uh, suggesting, you know, punctuation for it. But she wouldn't have that either. Mm. So um, we fell out. Mm. So, yes, I have had the odd bit of controversy. <laughs> you edited the Wildian for about 22 years. Are there particular articles that you're proudest of? Oh, well, yeah, it's, that's, that's hard because there's an awful lot coming mm -hmm. in that category. Um, may I just be indulgent and talk about things I've written, <laughs> written myself? <laughs> um, the, the things I'm happiest to have written are um, the account of Oscar's finances, mm -hmm. which uh, was a joint effort of mine and Anne Clark and Moore. Uh, we started together working on this and she uh, did the basic draft of the first two articles. Then uh, it got a bit bogged down with the need to deal with Tight Street auction and mm. um, the Tight Street catalogue. And, uh, well, to cut a long story short, it really just sort of uh, went on, went on rather long hold. And um, when... Uh, Anne slight sadly died. Her husband very uh, cooperatively said, I would be grateful if, as a sort of tribute to Anne, you would publish mm -hmm. the two articles she's drafted. And um, so I did that and added to them. And it ended up with a sequence of, of articles, uh, including... Um, I think the fullest account so far of exactly how much the Tight Street auction fetched mm. because um, I was able to do quite a bit of research there and identify some of the items which weren't, hadn't got a price on the published list. So mm. uh, that, that I, I was quite pleased with. Um, I think the thing I enjoyed doing particularly was, oddly enough, uh, Guillaume de Sakes. The um, Chant du Cine, the uh, Oscar Wilde Swan Song. Um, in the development of the Wildian, um, the key ch 
change made a few years back was from being a journal which published miscellaneous material of all sorts, lengths and degrees of uh, scholarly exactitude, uh, became a peer-reviewed peer journal. That is entirely down to Tom Wright, Thomas Wright, the author of Table Talk and Oscar's Books and many others. Um, he and I, at the time when the Oscar Wilde Society was in something of a problem uh, with uh, success, people to take over things, um, he... I did approach to become editor uh, in succession to me so that I could didn't have everything to do. Uh, and we had a long talk in Oxford about what the uh, Wild Inn could be. And he proposed it should be a peer-reviewed, uh, not a, a wholly peer-reviewed journal, but a journal in which peer-reviewed articles were published and essays so that we could, we didn't close the door to articles that weren't entirely and meticulously scholarly, uh, but we did, on the other hand, provide a uh, respectably academic platform for people writing uh, serious articles. So he proposed this. We knocked up a list of um, editors. Uh, we had all Franny Moyle and um, uh, I think we had John Sloan and uh, various people who were still on, still on the list. And uh, the whole idea of it being peer-reviewed was more or less completed between us, put to the committee who fairly instantly agreed. And um, that was a change of direction for the Wildian, absolutely decisive one. Uh, it was not that long before Robert Whelan took over. So Robert Whelan, as it were, inherited it at the beginning of its life as a peer-reviewed journal. And of course, under Robert, it's developed enormously as a as a peer reviewed journal, of which we are all very proud. I mm. think. And when did you become the chairman, Don? Uh, there are two dates for that, really. <laughs> um, at first, in 1995 or 1996, I was elected chairman uh, when we had an AGM, because you need to have somebody to be a chairman and somebody to take the minutes. So I was chairman of the AGM, and that was the nearest we had to a chairman. So we had the rather awkward thing, when somebody said, who's your chairman? We say, well, the chairman of the AGM. It, mm. it, it was silly. And, and it was Anne Clark and Moore who finally got tired of this and said, look, it's not just um, illogical, it's bizarre that we haven't got a chairman. Don's been actually as chairman all these years, shall we not elect him chairman? So they elected me chairman. And that was in 2002. As the chairman, did you have any particular goals for the society? I wanted it to be um, a, a good literary society. Uh, there was a certain amount of rivalry between us and the Betjeman, on a personal level, with the Betjeman Society, because a great friend of mine was chairman of the Betjeman Society. And uh, we used to exchange notes about you know, how, how, things, how things went and how things were done. Uh, they had a lot more events than we did. Um, and um, I also kept an eye on, for example, the, the Jane Austen Society. Uh, not many others, I must say, they only just knew about them. But what I really wanted was to feel that the society was, was strong and stable. And um, uh, the reputation depended partly on that and partly on the publications, because I was always very, very well aware keenly aware of the fact that uh, half the membership was overseas, uh, who were people who uh, didn't, most unlikely to come to events. So they, their uh, loyalty to the society or, or, or willingness to review their membership, renew their membership, depended on what they thought of the publications, because that was their, their point of contact. So I was very concerned that the society should be stable in terms of numbers and that it should, uh, the reputation of its publication should be strong so that it was a, a big, not too big, viable society. I didn't, I, I better just interpolate, having said not too big, I was rather put off by the Sherlock Holmes Society, uh, the the chairman of that happens to be not a fairly near neighbour. And I went to one or two events there. And they were big events where you had, uh, at best, 
a buffet and you circulate it with a, with a cardboard plate and a cup and a glass, or rather awkwardly. And I thought, you know, I don't think this is what the Oscar Wilde Society really ought mm. to be. And uh, our, my fellow members all agreed, you know. I think as one simply said, we are very good at a knife and fork, you know, and we really ought to, you know, <laughs> keep our uh, meetings to sit-down dinners, sit-down lunches, mm. where we can be properly convivial, mm -hmm. which you do in a way if you're circulating with a buffet. But I think there's not the same as sitting down. Mm. So uh, I think I was therefore uh, quite at ease with the idea that we only had, say, 300, 400 members, because that's about as many as accommodates that sort of way of working. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also a number which makes the society viable in terms of the uh, money collected, membership subscription, the amount left for administrative administrative purposes after the um, public after the publications have been paid for. Don, one of the really unique things about the society is that Merlin Holland, uh, Oscar Wilde's grandson, is one of our patrons. Tell me about working with Merlin. Well, Merlin was, of course. Uh, very much involved at the very beginning of the society. Uh, he worked with Joanna Crook, or Joanna Crook enlisted his help in setting up the society. Um, as the history says, uh, Joanna Crook looked everywhere, pre-internet days, looked everywhere for an Oscar Wilde society, couldn't find one, and decided the only thing to do was to found one. So she founded it, and she did that in cooperation with, with Merlin's active help and assistance. So Merlin was very much involved at the, at the beginning. Um, I personally first met Merlin at the auction of the Philip Griffiths Letters, which was uh, an auction at Christie's, written up in by me in, in Wildian number no. four. And um, he was there because there was one of those auctioneer's muddles where the letters were the exact order of them wasn't clear and uh, the wording was twisted slightly mm. to imply a growth in a, a relationship which wasn't really apparent from the letters themselves. And Merlin was uh, a bit concerned about that. Uh, and I, that's, that's when I first met him and had an introduction really to the, the finer points of um, looking at uh, what auctioneers say about letters. Uh, that leads on to another story, by the way, but I'll come to that um, if you'd like me to. Uh, Merlin was, uh, from the very beginning, a great help. He said, I would like you to make free use of material without copyright considerations, but please do acknowledge <laughs> The fact that you've done so, which we've we've always religiously done, but it doesn't make us any less grateful for all the help Merlin's been just with that one one thing, copyright. Um, he's uh, uh, given memorable talk to the society at the uh, National Liberal Club birthday dinner, where he told us really quite a lot about his forthcoming book after Oscar. And uh, in fact, he told us, I don't think I'm saying anything he would object to. He told us rather more than uh, rather more than he wanted seen in print. So uh, his uh, the account of his uh, of his talk is a sort of abbreviated, <laughs> abbreviated version. But uh, for those who were there, it was a remarkably uh, illuminating uh, indication of what uh, the afterlife of Oscar has been. And of course, our honorary president is Giles Brandreth. How did he get involved in the society? Giles joined the society. Um, I remember, I think I'm remembering right, at the time of a commemoration of the, uh, the unveiling of the, the tomb, the, the, the Jacob Epstein tomb. 
This was organised by uh, the French Oscar Wilde Society, or one of the French Oscar Wilde Societies. And uh, yes, there was a commemoration. It was organised by, um, among others, David Rose and um, uh, Daniel Guérin, who are Société Oscar Wilde en France, uh, which we uh, refer to in our website, a sort of sister society. Um, the uh, Giles was there and um, he was signed up. Um, I think he signed the form on my back when I sort of bent forward to provide a table for him. <laughs> and uh, he joined the society there and then, because uh, he and I both, well, he, he gave a, a major talk and I gave a short, short one standing by the tomb. Um, that was a, a very great occasion, actually, that, that, that visit. Um, then subsequently, uh, the story, which I'm sure Merlin wouldn't mind me repeating, is that from time to time, I would ask Merlin whether he would like to become president of the Oscar Wilde Society. Uh, I had always said that the position of president is left open. Uh, we had no president uh, and uh, left open for our senior patron. Um, and Merlin finally said, uh, I don't wish to be, it's incompatible with my personal role to be associated with, a, with an organisation. Why don't you ask Giles? And at, the, at about that time, I had reached precisely that conclusion that Giles was the person to ask. And I was about to ask Murdy whether he thought it was a good idea. So Giles was uh, appointed by acclamation, basically. Mm. Everybody said, of course, love to have Giles. Mm -hmm. And he's been a big uh, pro well, proponent of the society, hasn't he? He has been the most wonderful asset and support to the society in every possible way. I mean, he, he supports us uh, publicly and privately. He's always encouraging. He's always positive. Um, he is wonderful at social media. Mm -hmm. um, he's uh, an enormous support and publicist of the Oscar Wilde Society. He's mm -hmm. made us better known. I mean, I think he can take a lot of the credit for the fact that the society in the last three or four years has developed fast. Hmm. Let's dip back to the story you mentioned a moment ago about letters. You said there was a story about letters you could tell. Oh, there was the, uh, looking back, the lovely incident of the Alsager-Vian letters, uh, which turned up. He was the editor of the Court and Society Review and a uh, young journalist of enormous, enormous skill and promise and he edited this this journal and there were uh, already existing some letters between him and Oscar and a couple more turned up and um, ab so these were not at one of the major London auction houses and the uh, publicity put out was absolutely shamelessly careless or to use a, a mild word, and implied that Oscar and Al Sajavian were having an affair, which is a lunatic idea. Um, uh, and um, the, the key words were something like um, that Oscar used the phrase in relation to the fact that the Courton Society Review didn't get to the bookshops in the West End the next day as it sh as, it, as the next day after it they'd have been published in the in the city as it should have done and this is it this is a disgrace or something um and uh an exchange about the uh delays in delivering a magazine were twisted into Oscar concerned about delays in being able to meet El Sajervian. Yes. And uh, it said something like, can't wait till Thursday. And um, this was in the context of meeting up on a Friday. So the whole thing was totally lunatic, but it got all over the newspapers. And um, I had to write, I, with some pleasure, wrote a long letter about it 
One got published in the Telegraph. Merlin wrote about it. He got something published in the Times, and uh, the whole thing was was eventually uh, straightened out. But uh, what it led, incidentally, for me, was um, trotting up to uh, uh, Kingsbury in the days you know, the, the magazines were still there, and the only copy of the Court and Society Review they had for that period was the old the, the, the paper copy. So I had the great pleasure of the huge folio copy of the Court and Society Review, and searching in that for correspondence, and found a review by Oscar of um, a performance by Bilbo Tree, which was clearly by Oscar, although it was anonymous. And uh, so I was able, in the Wilde, to publish, for the first time, a review by Oscar Wilde. He was our distinguished contributor. Don, what are some of your fondest memories as chairman of the Oscar Wilde Society? They are undoubtedly the times when I felt that the society is... Um, congenial, um, the members are all enjoying them, enjoying it, um, that it's a, a society which is a, a pleasure to be a member of. And those do, of course, tend to be the events like the dinners, for example, mm. because if you've had a convivial dinner and you've listened to an entertaining speaker, I mean, for example, it might be Charles Brandreth or something, you know, or um, we've had some wonderful speakers over the years. Uh, then you have a feeling in the room that you are in a society which it is uh, a very great pleasure to be to be a member of. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's when I felt most that the society is at its at its best. Mm -hmm. And we've had a num great many occasions like that. I'm happy to say. So looking back at some of the trips that the Oscar Wilde Society has taken, do you have some favorite times or memories from those? I remember the, the, the first trip to Paris, where for the first time I saw the uh, L'Hotel mm. and Oscar's room and the, 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 the staircase, that very evocative staircase going up. And um, just, just to see that... Uh, I don't count Père Lachaise because that's part of everybody's experience, I think, seeing that. Um, the One of the most enjoyable was really in, in conjunction with, uh, with Julia Rosenthal, uh, going back a number of years. Uh, she had, um, just by correspondence, with the librarian at the Dieppe Public Library, um, got a bit of information about Oscar Wilde in, in Dieppe because she was uh, adding to her collection. She got one or two things related, well, several things related to Oscar Wilde in Dieppe and Berneval. So she was uh, trying to do a bit of local research on that. And the librarian at, uh, at Dieppe uh, told us uh, there are there's a couple interested in um, Oscar Wilde who live in Berneval. Bernadette, really? Oh, that's very interesting. And um, so we set off on a on a sort of recce, and um, drove down to 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 to, to Bernadette, and uh, were absolutely astonished to be greeted by the late Francis Gayer and his wife Elizabeth, who were local historians in. Uh, Dieppe, uh, in in Bernadette and in Dieppe, and who had written. Francis had written a couple of books about Oscar Wilde in uh, in Dieppe and Berneval uh, as part of his general histories of the general histories of the area, and uh, they greeted us and uh, you know showered us with showered us with anecdotes and uh, photocopies of miscellaneous items and uh, showed us round Berneval, and that was a wonderful occasion. And it was the beginning of a whole series of visits we've made over the years. I think there must be five or so in all uh, to, to Berneval, where um, uh, Francis Gale, a less no longer with us, um, Francis Gale and his wife and the uh, uh, two successive mayors, mayors of Berneval, uh, have been our hosts and uh, we've always been treated most... Um, Royally, really. And uh, they've, they've been wonderful occasions. Don, how has the Oscar Wilde Society changed your life over the last 30 years? 
Well, I find that difficult to answer because I don't know what my life over the last 30 years would have been like <laughs> if it hadn't been for the Oscar Wilde Society. So, uh, because really when I uh, was coming up to retirement, um, I was doing several things in preparation for it. One was to uh, uh, take up seriously doing painting, which I you know, spent a lot of time, so I still do, uh, doing. And um, also I was building up my uh, interest in Oscar in a, in a rather casual sort of way, just building a collection of books. You know, at one stage I had nearly a hundred, you know, I really felt I was getting to a, to a, to a, to a landmark there. And uh, surely it must be, my collection must be getting complete, ha ha. Um, so I was at that uh, very primitive stage. And uh, it's difficult to imagine uh, what my life would have been like if I hadn't uh, stumbled upon the Oscar Wilde Society at that time and joined it and become part of it. So uh, I think the answer is not, it didn't change it. It was, uh, it was a, a large section of my life. Mm. You see, what happens with, with a lot of people like me, I think, the job they're doing, uh, there's not much to do after you've retired. You may have a number of personal friendships, that's none, another matter. Um, retaining con actual connections, the only ones I retained really are various overseas ones. I'm still, still well in touch with people I got to know that way. But apart from that, uh, there's a, just a, a great gap where one's uh, circle of work colleagues used to be. There only just a very little of it left. And that place was taken by the Oscar Wilde Society. Um, why has the Oscar Wilde Society not supported a posthumous pardon for Oscar? Uh, incorrect question, if I may respectfully okay. say so. Um, there was, at the very, going back a number of years, occasional um, ideas that Oscar should be given a royal pardon. Um, there was at one stage, I think in the early 90s, a petition which didn't gather more than a handful practically, of votes. You know, it just didn't get anywhere near being done. At that time, uh, there were lots of differences of opinion. Um, one which uh, was held by a number of members of the society was, pardon him? That implies that he did something that needed to be pardoned. He didn't do anything that needed to be pardoned. His conviction was a disgrace a stain on British justice and on British society. You can't rewrite history. You leave it where it is. You leave him unpardoned to the disgrace of the judicial system. And you, you don't try and rewrite history. That was a point of view which was held quite strongly by a number of people in society. So at that time, there were people who wanted a pardon and there were people who equally, vociferously and equally logically, I think, didn't. So we couldn't, as a society, have a point of view. Mm. So we didn't support it, we didn't oppose it either. We just didn't, we, we said we are a society with, of individuals. We as a society don't have a point of view. That's going back a bit. Since then, of course, you've got the Alan Turing law and everything has changed. And uh, it, the, the terminology pardon has, I think, become accepted, though I think it's a disregard, isn't it? actually, technically. Mm. I don't know. But um, anyway, uh, that's, in, that's bringing us to the future, where, of course, we support the fact that he's part. Of course we do. Don, what funny stories do you remember from the Oscar Wilde Society? Um, funny stories? I've got a prompt here for you. The winner of the poetry competition at the Borstal in Reading. Oh, that one. <laughs> ah, yes. We, um, one of the connections we had from the very beginning of the society was with the um, Reading, Prison, Reading uh, Young Offenders Remand Centre, otherwise known as Reading Prison, otherwise known as Reading Jail. Uh, that goes right back to the beginning of the society. Uh, we established good relationship with the then governor, who was very welcoming, and we had regular visits to the society to Reading Jail, uh, which we did year after year. And that's, you know, the, the foundation of our current 
uh, attempt to help the uh, proper use of the, the, the building now. Um, at some stage, we were asked by the um, education officer at the prison to, um, well, enter a discussion. Could we, could we have a, an Oscar Wilde prize or something? So we agreed uh, to have an Oscar Wilde prize. There would be a competition for it. And Lady Longford, bless her, um, who was very interested in legal matters, as indeed was her husband. Um, she was uh, also a member of the society. Uh, no, she was a patron of the society. And um, she would have been one of their speakers too. Uh, but alas, she was too ill. Um, anyway, she went along to Reading. Um, I remember... We, we drove there and she said, uh, if the journey's too long, we can always stop and have a banana, can't we? And um, we, she was, she charmed the boots off the lads and they loved her because they saw her as the, you know, the ideal granny, you know. They, they, uh, they really took to her and they were all on their best behaviour. And they baked cakes and they were the boys from Reading Jail and they wanted to be remembered and so on. So it was all very cosy and happy. Um, so we had this competition, and Anne Clark and Moore and I were the were the were the uh, ones who uh, scrutinised the entries, and they were a pretty thin lot. They were they were well meaning, and some of them were uh, doing their best, but there wasn't anything very good except one, which was a, a poem about an electronic dog, and Anne and I both said, "This is amazing." It really is absolutely original. And uh, it's the winner, isn't it? So we were grieved. Yes, yes, this is the winner. And um, uh, Lady Longford presented the prize to the young lad who uh, was very casual about it. She said, she said, how long did it take you to write it? And he said, oh, not really very long, but um, I, uh, I wrote this other one. And as I was saying, anyway, he was quite chirpy uh, and brazen. He copied it from the record sleeve of a Frank Zappa record, which was in the in the in the prison library. And uh, Anne and I, I regret to say, were neither of us familiar with the works of Frank Zappa, so we didn't actually spot what it was. It was pointed out to us afterwards. So of course we had to issue a, a further supplement to the Wildian about the uh, about the, uh, the, the 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 prize giving and um, confessed all, as it were. And uh, Lady Longford, bless her, said, oh, well, it wouldn't really be Oscar if something, something amusing didn't happen, would it? She said cheerfully. And uh, so there you are. That was a, uh, very, a, harmless, a harmless episode, really, in the history of the society. Don, how was Oscar Wilde regarded when you were young? Well, when, how young is young? When I was at school, when I was at infant school, he was just a, a, a name one knew in in a vaguely, uh, well, not vaguely, a specifically naughty connection. Uh, it wasn't menacing; it was just naughty. You know. But um, that was that's that's only just my personal recollection. Um, judging by what I remember. <laughs> which is pretty little of what my parents said. Uh, that was really mainly uh, the feeling that Oscar was somebody who was uh, in sexual disgrace, you might say, uh, but who wrote The Importance of Being Earnest, which after mm -hmm. all I'd done at school, sort of. And how has the opinion or the reputation of Oscar changed since then? Well, hasn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think Oscar, Oscar is now uh, uh, moved pretty much beyond that. Uh, well, or has he come to think of it? Uh, <laughs> no, I think Oscar is is now appreciated on a on a very wide canvas now, as a as a wit and as a writer and as a dramatist and um, as a somebody whose life is to be, if not, not emulated, but certainly learned from. Mm. Do you think Oscar has peaked in popularity or do you think he'll continue to get new admirers? 
I might be on a plateau, but I don't think he's sort of, I don't think he's at a peak. I don't think he's going to go down. Mm. No, no, no. I think he's he's set set fair where he is. Mm. I mean, if you think of all the the dissertations on the uh, and theses on the subject of Oscar Wilde, and not all not all of them are about Dorian Gray, although I think most of them are. Um, as when you consider all those queuing up for uh, printing and publication, I think it's going to be a long time. One of the big questions about Oscar Wilde is always why he didn't flee the country after the Queensbury prosecution failed and he was about to be arrested. What's your opinion? Wasn't it? I'm trying to write in thinking that when Merlin wrote his little book, um, Coffee with Oscar, um, he said, if there's one question I would like to ask my grandfather, it would be, why? Why didn't you? Why didn't you leave? And... um, I, I, I think I'd go along with the, the combination of all the answers which would be proposed. That um, uh, one obvious one is that he didn't actually know just how strong Queensbury's case was. If he'd known what was uh, looming up in the way of, uh, of witnesses uh, to, his, uh, to his relationships, uh, if he'd known all that, he might have, that he might have thought again. Um, there's also the, the, the sheer uh, indecision, you know, just pressured by different points. You, you just hesitate and hesitate and time goes by and you have another glass of hock and, you know, so it goes on. Time, just hesitating. Um, and um, the, the hubris one, you know, that uh, this is a chance for me to really show Ned Carson up. I can I can make mince me to these people. They they can't they can't outwit me. Uh, of course he was nearly right on that. Um, and of course the other one, he wanted to please Bosie. So uh, I think a combination of those things is enough to <laughs> stop him catching the boat. Mm. Don why are Oscar's life and work and ideas important today? Well, <laughs> because they're funny, because they're wise, um, and they're witty, and he did have a way of being very modern in what he wrote. His writing doesn't date, it's surprisingly, doesn't date at all. His vocabulary is, is, is very modern. Um, so they are, you're reading something that you, you feel is contemporary. And um, I think the, the basic thing, which I think it was uh, Borges, Borges said, uh, that uh, he has a way of being right. Don, what would you like to say to people who are just discovering Oscar Wilde? Put that computer and that smartphone away. Stop looking up highlights of Oscar and little bits and pieces of Oscar. Get a copy of his complete works. It'll probably cost you a fiver. And um, read Oscar on the printed page. Uh, Read his dialogue, read read Dorian Gray, read it properly, read the whole of Dorian Gray. Read his poems, read The Ballad of Reading Jail right through in one sitting. You'll remember it. Do that. Read read the dialogues. If you can get the letters, which are not that expensive, read the letters and uh, read the reviews, of course. Um, So I would say, do some reading. And then when you have really got yourself uh, informed about what Oscar wrote, then by all means, Go back to the internet and search. There's a lot of interesting stuff to be found. But please start with what Oscar wrote.